So, this was love. I had escaped it for all the years I had roamed the five continents and their encircling seas, in spite of beautiful women and urging opportunity, in spite of a half-desire for love and a constant desire for my ideal. It had remained for me to fall furiously and hopelessly in love with a creature from another world, of a species similar, possibly, yet not identical with mine, a woman who was hatched from an egg and whose span of life might cover a thousand years, whose people had strange customs and ideas, a woman whose hopes, whose pleasures, whose standards of virtue and of right and wrong might vary as greatly from mine as did those of the green Martians. Yes, I was a fool, but I was in love, and though I was suffering the greatest misery I had ever known, I would not have had it otherwise, for all the riches of Barsoom. Such is love, and such are lovers, wherever love is known. To me, Deja Thoris was all that was perfect, all that was virtuous and beautiful and noble and good. I believed that from the bottom of my heart, from the depth of my soul, on that night in Korad, as I sat cross-legged upon my silks, while the nearer moon of Barsoom raced through the western sky toward the horizon, and lighted up the gold and marble and jeweled mosaics of my world-old chamber, and I believe it today as I sit at my desk in the little study overlooking the Hudson. Twenty years have intervened, for ten of them I lived and fought for Deja Thoris and her people, and for ten I have lived upon her memory. The morning of our departure for Thark dawned clear and hot, as do all Martian mornings, except for the six weeks when the snow melts at the poles. I sought out Deja Thoris in the throng of departing chariots, but she turned her shoulder to me, and I could see the red blood mount to her cheek. With the foolish inconsistency of love, I held my peace when I might have pled ignorance of the nature of my offence, or at least the gravity of it, and so have effected, at worst, a half-consolation. My duty dictated that I must see that she was comfortable, and so I glanced into her chariot and rearranged her silks and furs. In doing so, I noted with horror that she was heavily chained by one ankle to the side of the vehicle. What does this mean? I cried, turning to Sola. Sarkoja thought it best, she answered, her face betokening her disapproval of the procedure. Examining the manacles, I saw that they fastened with a massive spring lock. Where is the key, Sola? Let me have it. Sarkoja wears it, John Carter, she answered. I turned without further word and sought out Tars Tarkash, to whom I vehemently objected to the unnecessary humiliations and cruelties, as they seemed to my lover's eyes, that were being heaped upon Deja Thoris. John Carter, he answered, if ever you and Deja Thoris escape the Tharks, it will be upon this journey. We know that you will not go without her. You have shown yourself a mighty fighter, and we do not wish to manacle you, so we hold you both in the easiest way that will yet ensure security. I have spoken. I saw the strength of his reasoning at a flash, and knew that it was futile to appeal from his decision, but I asked that the key be taken from Sarkoja, and that she be directed to leave the prisoner alone in future. This much, Tars Tarkash, you may do for me in return for the friendship that I must confess I feel for you. Friendship? he replied. There is no such thing, John Carter, but have your will. I shall direct that Sarkoja cease to annoy the girl, and I myself will take the custody of the key. Unless you wish me to assume the responsibility, I said, smiling. He looked at me long and earnestly before he spoke. Were you to give me your word that neither you nor Deja Thoris would attempt to escape until after we have safely reached the court of Talhajus, you might have the key and throw the chains into the river Is. It were better that you held the key, Tars Tarkash, I replied. He smiled and said no more, but that night, as we were making camp, I saw him unfasten Deja Thoris's fetters himself. With all his cruel ferocity and coldness, there was an undercurrent of something in Tars Tarkash which he seemed ever battling to subdue. Could it be a vestige of some human instinct come back from an ancient forebear to haunt him with the horror of his people's ways?